Hi there, everyone. Thank you all for coming this evening. I think we'll make a bit of a start. We have several people now turned up because it's been, like I said earlier on, it's been a bit light on people by the looks of it. So tonight's talk is going to be about your grassland and how we can assess your grow, how you can assess your grassland, what improvements you probably need to make to it after the winter we've had and the autumn we've had, and then build your productivity for the summer along or the summer coming. We have a Fabulous speaker tonight, Paddy Jack. He's supported us through DLF for several years. Uh, Paddy is a, an Irish farmer boy from Northern Ireland and has been living in Scotland. I think his comment was he moved to Scotland to Edinburgh University and then never went home. Um, I think Scotland and Ireland are pretty sweet places, so I'd probably stick with that if I was up there, I must admit. Uh, he's also worked with ICI for several years and was a fertilizer manager and a malting barley buyer. So quite a diverse background historically. So a couple of things before we start. If you look at the top of your screen, you should have a Q&A button. If you have any questions you want to ask, please click on there anytime you want and then write in your question and we'll do our best to answer it. If you, um, you you'll find you're muted and your picture won't be up on the screen, there's only two pictures, two ugly mugs. One is Paddy's and one is mine. Um, that's just so we don't have too many people talking over each other. But feel free to pop any questions in. So I'm not going to dwell on too much longer. I'm just going to pass over to Paddy at this point and let him carry on with a with a fabulous talk for the next 40 minutes. Paddy Jack. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you from uh, my eldest daughter's bedroom. She has moved out two years ago, but we still refer to it as my eldest daughter's bedroom. And as I was telling John earlier on, we have builders in. Uh, so this is the third temporary office I've been based in. Um, I'd like to say a thank you to John and to RM Jones for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Um, I have been out on farm today, which is a great treat for me because nowadays I'm stuck behind the screen and um, in an office most of the time. So I was out assessing uh, lucerne and uh, Italian ryegrass and perennial ryegrass um, and indeed a red clover uh, on, on farms that I have worked on uh, since the early 1980s. So um, I like nothing better than being on farm. What I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to share my screen and maybe John can let me know um, that my screen has been seen. If you're good enough to do that, folks, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> Something's happening. I think you're there, Paddy. Yeah, I think you're there. So we just need to go to presentation mode and we're there. Yes. That's okay, all working. Folks, Phew, um, I've got a sigh of relief there now from me. <laughs> I have to be very careful and keep looking at my watch because I actually really genuinely like talking about grass. So um, uh, I'll try not to bore you. I'll try and be um, uh, light and, uh, and relatively quick through some of the slides, folks. So grass problems and what to do about them. Um, first of all, uh, what harm has been done to grassland, how to assess your swords and your soils. Um, then looking at key species, this was uh, an agenda that largely John drew up for me, key species to use both in conventional mixtures, but also now more and more the inquiries are coming through for multi-species legume and herbs, particularly in the light of the SFI. Uh, then very briefly, just mentioning why downland mixtures. I've actually only got one mixture up. Um, I have two slides on a hybrid brassica because I think for a lot of people with livestock, um, using uh, an alternative forage crop will become um, increasingly um, important as we try to avoid lorries coming up the roads with loads of cake on it. <clears throat> so damage swords, first of all, obviously continuous wet feet does limit root growth it, li it limits all roots uh, well, not just grass plants obviously and if roots are limited then we have less production but with grasses rarely does it kill the plants um you know if we look at things like winter oats and winter wheat and so on at the moment we can certainly see where plants have actually rotted away um, but with grass um it generally rarely kills it we have a very large festival here in edinburgh for the month of august and for five weeks there are marquees put up on um bits of grass around edinburgh and when those when those marquees are taken down the grass uh, on the surface is absolutely dead looking 
but I have been involved in, 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 in restoring these bits with them. And when you actually open up the soils and have a look, there is white colour in the roots. And as sure as there's white colour, the, the, those plants come back to life again. So it's a simple colour thing in my book. And grass, particularly perennial ryegrass, is very, very resilient. Young grass wards or those late sown last year, of course, are much more vulnerable. Um, on, on one farm, Baird at Lurden Law today, I looked at three grass fields that were all sown at the same time. Only one of them hasn't been grazed. The two that have had a lot of store lambs on them looked atrocious. Uh, the one that hasn't been grazed at all looks fantastic. And he's hoping to silage that in Scotland um, before he puts in fodder beets. So it's going to be cut about 28th, 29th, 30th of April. So where we've had a lot of wet rain and a lot of sheep we have problems so assessing the damage what are we looking for as i say pull up the plants look at the roots take your spade you know farmers don't have to use back actor diggers to look at their grass they can use a spade or a trowel um uh, brown roots are dead white roots uh, alive working good news if you see white roots feel a lot more confident Check for sown species because there is so much, particularly annual meadow grass, but meadow grasses of all types come through when we have continual wet. They, they seem to thrive on it. And indeed, bent grasses do very well. Um, there isn't a field in the UK that won't have Yorkshire fog in it. So we're not just assessing green material or leaf area index. We are actually looking to see that the species are the species we need. Simple, um, you know, most of you will clearly know how to identify a ryegrass. Look at it in a good day. We've always got the pinky purpley root. That's a really good indication. That covers hybrids, Italians, um, perennial ryegrass, also covers bestilolems. But the simplest way is the shiny, shiny nature of the outside of the leaf. The V on the outside, uh, if it's shiny, you've got a perennial ryegrass. It's glabrous, waxy on the inside. Um, uh, and if you just want to check, follow down to the root system. Plant counts, perhaps one of the easiest and best ways to assess. What I say is, uh, yeah, you can have a quadrat. You can go out and count a lot. I have many uh, quadrats. Uh, I have some made out of curtain rail material that form a circumference that gives me a known area in the middle. I also have my two meter um, rule from being a cereal seed inspector. Uh, but I can assure you, if you're counting blocks that are that big, um, meter, meter by a meter, um, you, you, you're you're really going to struggle to do it right. What I do is I put my two heels uh, together at 90 degrees and, and put my trowel in to square it off as a foot by a foot by a foot. And I want to see 30 or more plants in that square foot. Uh, do many counts across the field because if you stop in a wet hole, you're not going to get 30 plants. And if you stop in a double sown head rig, you're going to get, you know, thousands of plants. You won't be able to count it. So 30 or more is my cutoff for whether or not we're really going to get a, a, a good grass system. What can you do then chemical wise? Um, you know, obviously uh, roots that have been hindered, you want to make sure they've got adequate phosphate and indeed potash, although people sort of forget that roots, they always think phosphate's what we need for roots. Uh, and where we've got thin plants and plants that haven't tillered particularly strongly in the autumn, nitrogenous fertilizer is always going to help uh, bud off daughter tillers to the sides. So nitrogenous fertilizer early will help, particularly probably um, urea and urea sulfur based ones correcting the damage most healthy soils with good organic matter are actually pretty resilient to water logging um, if you've got organic matters of four and a half to eight something like that and um, you're in a good healthy situation if you're above eight you're really really lucky um, and i guess in herefordshire monmouthshire welsh borders you're probably going to have relatively good organic matter contents where we look at the arable farms in the eastern side of the country that have only just recently gone into grass or legumes or, or indeed many of them into multi-species for, for money reasons. And the organic matter contents are particularly low, well under 2%. And these soils are nothing like as, as easy for water to filter through. So they get waterlogged far, far easier. And uh, conversely, their water holding capacity is dramatically reduced as well. Physical soil damage, um, that's probably our biggest single worry. There's biological loss of soil biota as well by drowning, but, but it will come back in most situations. On the physical soil uh, damage, if you remember 2012, 2017, 
um, where, uh, where, where land has been farmed by someone who's either coming out or doesn't really care or is in a big scale or perhaps doesn't look after the land as well as they should, we saw damage for the subsequent three, four years. Where someone actually gets into a ditch and rods it or jets it, pretty unpleasant jobs, you know, um, <clears throat> I'd rather move a, a hot fence through a wet kale crop <clears throat> than go and jet drains, but it's very, very important. <clears throat> clean drains, uh, open them up, make sure that the outfalls are, are clean because so many people have ditches that haven't been properly cleaned out. Simple physical things. Um, uh, modern machinery is bloody hard on soils uh, in comparison to the old smaller tractors, you know, 140 horsepower tractor really didn't cause an awful lot of damage with the sort of machinery it was pulling. Um, nowadays, these 260 horsepower tractors are extremely heavy. <clears throat> I've thrown in the comment there as well about uh, gypsum. I don't sell any of these things now, um, but I do know that where some people have slump soils or particularly where there's been a lot of magnesium lime put on or where there's a very high clay content in the soil, um, uh, it, it, gypsum is certainly um, alleviating the problem uh, and indeed helping uh, the, the plants recover faster. Sward performance. So what what is sward performance? What are we looking for? Um, uh, a grass field will yield its highest amount in year one. So if you sow grass in April this year, April 2024, this is year zero. So the first year for that grass is year 2025. So people forget that the year of establishment doesn't count. So first year is the year after its first winter. So unless it's an annual grass, like a, a, a Westerolium, a, a, the annual form of, of, of Italian. So year one is next year um, and they're in their biggest yield and they do deteriorate. Even a pure stand, a pure stand in our trials with no ingress of weeds um, will fall off. <clears throat> Economically, you could probably keep them for seven years, eight years, but I say about five years. Um, and it's just that this, even as a pure, pure sward of that grass, they just don't hold the production. We also have the ingress of grass weeds, um, more and more being grass weeds, uh, particularly uh, the meadow grasses. I can remember in the 80s when I first did my basis, um, we used to say that the control of, of, of annual meadow grass in cereal crops um, was not worth worrying about. It didn't have an impact on yield. Um, now we see meadow grasses in all cereal crops and, and indeed, well, since we lost stomp, even more so. Um, uh, and also, of course, we see them right through through um, through po poached ground as well. Broadleaf weeds, well, clearly, if we have a lot of poaching, we tend to get docks, thistles and nettles coming in. <clears throat> Chickweed, only really normally a problem in the establishment phase, but... Um, John and, and, and his colleagues are very good at controlling all these broadleaf weeds on your behalf. Obviously, the more damage you cause, whether it's by uh, livestock, um, sheep's feet or cattle feet, um, depending on where and what, and of course, the machinery situation. Uh, nothing is getting any easier. <clears throat> so we damage sword performance. This limits the production we can get. Now, well-run farms in good growing areas with, with, with where the fertility is good, can produce somewhere between 14 and 16 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. Uh, one, of, one of my partner farms in Dumfrieshire, um, a young chap who's not quite 30 yet, um, he is hitting 18 tonnes of dry matter a hectare in rotational grazing in an extremely favourable farm with a lot of fertility. Um, some of my Irish colleagues are also hitting sort of 18 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. If you look at the actual NIAB trial results, they measure grass yields in years one, two and three, and the average between about 13 and a half and 15 tonnes, with the intermediate tetraploids probably being the highest yielding of them all. We put that in line with what UK average grass production, and this is grass production of what is called rotational grass, not off upland grass, it's off rotational grass, is about five and a half tonnes of dry matter a hectare. So there's plenty of room for, for improvement on that. How do we measure how you're doing? Well, you could obviously measure the weight of lamb you produce per hectare or the amount of milk you produce per hectare. But when we're actually measuring the botanical growth, 
then um, in greeting situations, a plate meter um, or, or a sword stick are, are, are really the, the, the best ways to do it. Um, if it's in a silage situation, a cutting situation, um, and there is a weigh bridge nearby, um, weigh a couple of trailer loads and then count the number of trailer loads. Um, uh, you can get a, a moisture content in, in your microwave if you want to or in your oven. Um, but um, it's it's important that you know which fields are performing at their poorest. What species to use? Well, there's really um, uh, two sides to the, the argument at the moment. We have to look at both. Um, uh, having been in grass seed um, for 40 years, because I started selling grass seed, the first thing I ever sold in 1981 was grass seed. Um, there are the conventional mixtures and they are still the backbone of the UK. Um, uh, forage mixtures in the UK are about 11,000 tonnes. Um, so it's a huge amount. Um, it should be bigger, of course. Uh, and these are predominantly made up of perennial ryegrass and clover uh, with more Timothy the further north or the further up or the higher the soil or the more water retentive soil there are. But perennial ryegrass and white clovers are the backbones. Um, if I look at our sales, we put up through about 4,000 tonnes through our plant uh, in, in Edinburgh, on our warehouse in Edinburgh, um, and about 88% of it is perennial ryegrass. Why is it the backbone? Why are we still using it? And why are we so dependent on it? And why is so much of the breeding focused on it? Well, um, it, it is very highly productive. Um, uh, it's good quality. Um, you know, we've got MEs of above 12 for most of the grazing season. Occasionally it drops to under 11, but for instance, uh, to, 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 to under 12, but over 11. Um, you have years like this where our autumn production of grass, if you could get stock onto it, has been quite phenomenal. Um, it is predictable. Um, we can guess. In fact, if we look at year against year from 1st January to the end of December, dry years, wet years, whatever, we nearly always end up with the same, approximately the same amount of dry matter production in that 12 month period. Although it doesn't all come at the same time every year, depending on the lack of moisture or too much moisture. Obviously, it's very uh, flexible in that we can cut it and graze it. It's easy to manage. Although, although it is hard to manage uh, very, very well. If you're going to try and knock out 15, 16 tons of grass, you're really going to have to be on top of your game. Um, it is winter hardy. All the perennial species that we use in the UK are truly perennial. Um, we're very lucky. We're blessed, in fact, in Scotland in that we still contribute. Merchants and farmers still pay 3.2 pence a kilogram to keep independent trialling done by the Scottish Agricultural College. And in that, we have a winter hardiness trial at a farm um, uh, called Clash Neuer. Um, which is in Glenlivet. It's at 1,050 feet and um, quite interesting to see which grasses survive and which grasses do poorly. Um, uh, we, we own a lot of breeding programs around the world um, and quite interestingly, almost everything that comes out of New Zealand um, fails to survive our winters. Um, good sward density, of course, we get wet, wet, wet weather like this and um, Perennial ryegrasses have the ability to tiller. If you have a ryegrass sward that you cut for an entire season, a pure one single cultivar, uh, and the trials were done, sorry, sounding like I'm an Aberdonian, I'm not, were done in Aberdeen by a guy, John Weddle, almost 30 years ago. He took an old, old late diploid called Lasso, and they cut it for an entire year. So probably that length of time ago, it would be cut three times and they grazed it rotationally with sheep for an entire year. And they measured the number of tillers in both. And there was six and a half times as many tillers in the gray sward as there was in the cut sward of the same species, of the same cultivar, the same variety. So if you want to thicken a sward up, your own management of it with rotational sheep is absolutely the best thing to do. What's next to that? Probably rotational small, uh, small cattle. As a downside to, to conventional mixtures with perennial ryegrass and white clover, uh, and uh, Timothy or not, <clears throat> they are really quite relatively shallow rooted, 12 to 14 centimetres, and are therefore more prone to drought. 
We then now have the most exciting thing that's happening and um, all governments in Europe and not seem to be throwing money at multi-species mixtures. The idea that legumes will take over and feed us all um, is great. They do have a role to play, make no mistake about it. And we have huge investment in breeding leguminous plants. Um, obviously the holy grail of, of a, a ryegrass, a perennial ryegrass that fixes nitrogen um, you know, you read articles about it every now and then, but it's still quite a long way off. So multi-species swords have come in. They have a, a lot of benefits. I was pretty skeptical being a man in my mid 60s. You think you've seen it all. Um, I was quite skeptical. However, I have become really quite converted to them. So um, many of you will have tried them, I know. Um, I know John has. We had a lovely open day down there in a gorgeous evening uh, one night, and you could see lots of benefits of them. So we get high production, particularly in years one and two, somewhat less in year three. And on some of the multi-species legume and herb mixtures, we don't really have an awful lot in years four or five, depending on how they're managed. They graze particularly well. Um, the more legumes and herbs that we have in a sward, the less good will be the silage. It's dead simple. It's just about quick release of sugars to get a good lactic acid fermentation, to get a quick drop in the pH, stop the other cells rupturing, so you hold the rest of the sugars in, in the silage. Um, we don't get that because there isn't the sugar content in, in legumes, uh, nor is there in, in the herbs. Uh, so um, best silage made off a legume and herb mixture is when there's a decent amount of grass. Uh, I would certainly say use an additive, and if you're putting it in a bale, I would say wrap it um, a couple of extra times as well. Um, plantains don't really have much of an anthelmintic effect, but chicories do. Um, I think if you've got dirty lambs or, or you know, you probably need to drench them. Um, but if you're on the edge and you're not quite sure and they're on a, a herbal lay, you probably don't need to. To get the most out of them, they need a, a, a form of rotational grazing or even a, a mob grazing, some sort of cellular grazing anyway, so that you can give the, the, the legume a decent amount of time to, to uh, recover. Um, with perennial ryegrasses, et cetera, we're normally on, on 21 day in the middle of the summer. Um, where I've got um, um, things like uh, plantains and chicories flying in their first year, um, I'm often down as low as 15 days even less than grass. However, with the more holistic approach and people wanting to leave some behind, then they're, they're running the, the rotations way out, way out in, in fact, in winter time, 60 to 80 days. Um, I, I think there's a huge amount of spoilage and it really is a waste of, of, of dry matter if you do that. Of Andy, course- Can I just in, interrupt there quickly? Yeah. Yeah, I've just had a couple of questions come up. Uh, yeah. Can we go through them now before, while they're pertinent? Absolutely, yeah. So the just going back a little bit to talking about productivity through the year and yeah. how much volume of crop you produce is pretty consistent year on year, but obviously comes at different times. The question yeah. was, what elements of quality decline in the autumn? Everything. Everything, right, okay. Yeah. That answers yeah. that question. But, is, it, so, is it just as the plant lignifies and becomes a bit more fibrous yeah. and you yeah. lose the... So the... I always thought that the the the, the the structure in that plant, the cell walls, which you need to hold the plant up to make it more erect, et cetera, in the stems, that had to be quite a high, quite, a lot of protein in there. I guess that's not the case. The protein sits well, within the cell sap, et cetera, does it? Yeah, but remember this carb, yeah, the, all the proteins are in the lipids, et cetera, in, within the cell, within the cell um, the contents. But if you think of the of the structural carbohydrate, the, the, the ME that could be gleaned from a, a grass plant, the amount of water soluble carbohydrate, i.e. the sugars that are within a cell, are approximately half of the amount of carbohydrate that we can extract from the cell wall. So um, the cellulose and the hemicellulose, which are what ruminant animals have been designed for, for using, are all in the cell walls. So when a grass plant is kept young, so I mean, right through to October, you can have an ME of 12, yeah? But as, if, if you, as you let plants get older through the year, all they're doing is laying down lignin. And of course, lignin is entirely indigestible to all ruminants. So we want to manage grasses to keep the fiber within them as cellulose and hemicellulose and not let it lignify at all. But, you know, protein in a, a young grass plant in May could be 26, 28 percent. 
um, whereas by by September it's fifteen percent. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so protein content falls. ME tends to fall because people don't manage it as well. They let it run towards the seed head. Um, they, they, they often let themselves build up covers towards the winter. Um, understandable, particularly with things like bale greys and stuff like that. And all the time, John, plants are doing what nature wants them to do. It's laying down fibre. So we have to prevent that you know, conversion from cellulose entirely digestible by a ruminant animal from chewing the cud um, uh, uh, we have to prevent it lignifying so just making sure we're using it when it's at this optimum stage not just letting it get stemmy putting seed heads up because then it's just past its best or we get yeah. a long stem on it that's you, you're losing it then yeah the, the things that are happening is the plant is laying down dry matter but it's losing me and it's losing protein yeah, but it is yeah. gaining in dry matter. So if you're doing nothing but making some bales for feeding to a spring calving suck cow that has a calf inside her, but she's not milking, then she hasn't a great requirement for ME um, and you can leave her standing hay. Um, but it is a waste of, of dry matter production where you're trying to hit 14, 15 tons of dry matter, that should never be part of your thought process. That is someone who's on a more upland farm and is building covers for, for, for a standing hay or a bale graze or something like that. Where you're trying to graze um, to absolutely maximize, you have to keep utilizing it before that fourth leaf comes. Because as soon as that fourth leaf comes on a grass plant, the, 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 the oldest leaf is dead. So grass, obviously the new leaves come right up the middle of a plant, folks. Proper grazing time for, for cattle is probably between two and a half and three and a half leaf. And um, that fourth leaf coming out the middle of a plant means the outside leaf is dying and we're starting to get formation of a stem. Formation of a stem means lignification. Yep. So that's why grazing grass has always got a much higher ME and a much higher protein than a silage grass. Just one other quick question that followed on from that. that it's um, again on WhatsApp. Perennial ryegrass is seen by some as unsuitable for regen grassland. How can you manage without it in the system? Do you need to reduce stocking rates? Yeah, um, if you don't have perennial ryegrass, you're challenged because we have to look at the other species. Um, so what's going to match it? What, what you know? I mean, in regen agriculture, I can assure you, I have I have perennial ryegrass in. I just don't fertilize it as hard. But perennial ryegrass um, at 100 kilograms of nitrogen. 80 units of nitrogen is still a really sensible um, pr producer. In organic systems, perennial ryegrass is still the backbone of the vast majority of them. But if we are faced, as we are frequently faced, with people who do not want any perennial ryegrass, other than the horse people, um, we have to look at the alternative species, John. So what have we got? We've got Timothy, yeah? Yields about 80% of what a perennial ryegrass does. Um, is extremely palatable, but is nothing like as digestible. So the level of megajoules of energy you can harvest from a kilogram of dry matter from Timothy ain't going to give you the same level of live weight gain or milk production. Coxfoot, well, um, Coxfoot is nature's first uh, naturally occurring tetraploid. That's why it's very clumpy and its roots are very deep. Um, but the leaves have got silica on it. Even the newer varieties like Donata that have been bred with less silica on them are still incredibly unpalatable and um, if the grass starts to get away at all from stock the one species they will go round and leave is the, the the coxford so it gets much harder to clean out clean out swords we then go to meadow fescue and meadow fescue is one of the shyest establishing plants i know uh, if we have a high inclusion of meadow fescue and i mean four or five kilograms in an acre you virtually see none of it until the second year and um, i'm really really worried when people sow away mixtures with high levels of meadow fescue and no ryegrass because the the the, the weed ingress is normally particularly bad and um, so we've got coxford timothy meadow fescue you've got red fescues you've got smooth stock meadowgrass smooth stock meadowgrass i doubt if we really ever see in an agricultural sward um so we're a bit limited so if we don't have perennial ryegrass what do we have tall fescue it's probably as unpalatable as a coxford um we're very limited john um but i mean i, I do that have yeah, I do have mixtures that have got all these sort of grasses in them, but the backbone of them is probably still perennial ryegrass. Yeah, well, there's a phrase in there, I think, that's along the lines of with with Coxford, it can starve a lamb or, or do 10 lambs really well. You've just yeah. got to keep really on top of it and keep it keep it young all the time. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there are better Coxfords. And, you know, um, if we look at North America, there's a huge amount of, of swords of Coxfoot grown. And uh, certainly breeding on Coxfoot is important nowadays. And we are definitely breeding. Um, you know, if you pick a Coxfoot plant up and, and run it over your leaf, your, your lips, you'll feel the, the, the saw like the teeth, you know, the silica. Um, and there are now varieties of coxwood that don't have that however they still have a hairiness to the leaf um just like a tall fescue and anything does really well in dry conditions if you think of the um you know the the southern european grasses um tall fescues and and, and things like that they're all got nature's defense and making them the stomata less open they 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 they, they don't lose as much moisture and heat and that makes them all less palatable um, uh, and indeed the forage made off them is also still lower in ME. So there's a real challenge if we're doing a regen mixture for someone and they don't want perennial, I mean, I, mean, I would put 60 or 70% perennial ryegrass in a mixture for regenerative farming um, because it works um, uh, and it's flexible um, and stock like eating it and they thrive on it. Um, yeah, I think uh, all, it, our, all ours do anyway, don't they have uh, an element of PRG in there? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They do, um, uh, and they will they will continue to do so as long as I'm involved. <laughs> sure. and uh, thank you for that, Paddy. Just a just a reminder to everyone at the top of the screen, you've got a Q and A button. If you want to ask any questions, click on there, type your question, in, I'll read it out, or you can WhatsApp me. Uh, I think most of you've got my number. If you haven't, then stick in the Q and A button. If you have uh, an iPad, I've been told it's at the bottom of the screen. Um, I can't stand iPads. I never know which way I'm going with them. But if you want to click on the bottom of the screen on the Q&A on those, stick a question in there. Not a problem at all. And we'll read it out and see what sort of response we get from Paddy. Anyway, in the meantime, Paddy, please carry on. Not a problem. Not a problem. So I was saying, of course, there's the attraction that came about from the uh, high nitrogen prices uh, from uh, Ukraine and, and the, the Russian response. Um, and we had the dizzy heights of, of I think, even £900 a tonne for nitrogenous fertiliser. So farmers um, turned their heads to more and more legumes. We put a limit on 300 kilograms of clovers to any single one um, uh, buyer uh, because we were selling out so much. Um, there is still a lot of people believe that overseeding every acre with clovers would have solved the problems. Now, you know, clover is indeed a, a very important species in multi-species mixtures, but it's also very important species in conventional mixtures. So um, all I say is please don't forget the conventional mixtures because they do work very, very well. Anyway, we get poorer sward density from multi-species legumes, uh, uh, but the big big positive about them with these dry summers, not just 2018, but nearly every year now we're starting to get dry summers, is that they are very drought tolerant and stock thrive on them, let's be honest. <clears throat> Dowland grass mixtures, folks, it's just I'm going to bang through that really quickly. Um, they are high germination and purity. You would expect that. They're proven right across the UK. We have some of the best dairy farmers in the southwest of Scotland are cutting it five times uh, and feeding a lot of dairy cows off it. Um, we, you know, we have a really good range of, 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 of grass mixtures, which are tested uh, independently. We sow out the mixtures um, in uh, Gloucestershire. Uh, we're actually moving our trial site from um, Didbrook um, up to um, a, a new site we've bought um, somewhere near, oh, Per sure, per sure, I think it is. Uh, but we don't just trial uh, single cultivars. We actually sow away the biggest selling mixtures. Um, and there's two of the, the downland mixtures get sown there. Um, and a big driving focus from DLF trifolium and indeed Le Lima grain are to breed grasses with higher levels of digestibility. This is really just delaying the lignification within the varieties. And the way we select grasses to do that is just like picking a bull. If you want a bull that has um, shorter gestation or better feet or higher butter fat or whatever like that, you can go online and select the bull you want. And somebody has looked at his genetic profile and then you select from a huge computer, you use them to crash through uh, and, and you pick out the traits that that 
the, the already proven bulls have. We do the same with grasses, grasses that have higher level of digestibility. We breed from them, we look for their genetic profile and where we can match that genetic profile, we select those cultivars, assuming that they meet all the other criteria. And it takes probably, cuts the breeding program from 11 years down to seven or eight. Uh, and it speeds up breeding, uh, which is really, really good news. Downland cut and graze, um, look, it's a very general purpose mixture. I threw in a slide of it just to highlight that it is really, really selected for, for high quality grasses. Um, the reasons they're put together is because um, it's discussed. I go and meet a downland grass specialist um, and myself, and we take the NIA book and we indeed take the PPI, the Profit from Pasture Index in Ireland, and the SAC book, and we look at them and decide on the mixtures every single autumn. Uh, excellent crown rust. Anyway, moving on to more non-conventional mixtures, because that's what a lot of us are doing. Legume and herb lays. Um, uh, the, the opening slide I see from John was uh, was the one on the left-hand side, Hamish Dykes at South Slipperfield, who was the original guy on Lambing Live. Some of you might remember him. Um, Anyway, the pros and cons of legume and herb lays, and these are ones initially that don't have a lot of ryegrass. The, the one we're looking at there had four kilograms an acre of ryegrass in it, uh, four kilograms an acre. Now, the New Zealanders, um, a, a chap, Trevor Cook, who comes over and lectures every year, he's a bit of a grassland specialist, although he's a vet, he doesn't like any ryegrass in legume and herb mixtures, but that is because of the snails going up the ryegrass plants, um, it's it's all to do with worm burdens uh, that he doesn't want them. However, they can get away with pure um, plantain, chicory type swords in New Zealand. We cannot here because we have so much more rain right through the year um, and we uh, we get far more poaching if we don't have ryegrasses in the bottom. So similar live weight gain uh, to ryegrass swords, um, but they're much more drought tolerant. So a lot of positives, and of course they suit NUM2, and more importantly, perhaps SAM3. And I'm coming on to that. Um, against them, um, yes, they will last four years, and indeed five years, but the, the level of production from them crashes way below what it does from a perennial ryegrass and, and clover sward. You have to transition onto them. Um, we have had issues with people um, taking stuff or uh, store lambs home, um, taking them off the lorry uh, and running them straight onto a field. Um, and and, and uh, what you tend to get is you'll get one lamb that'll put its head down and eat nothing but the red clover or something, you know. The, so we, we do get problems that way. And of course, they don't cut well. They do not make a good silage. This field that we're looking at here, these two fields actually that we're looking at here, they were cut for silage um, uh, and they were fled to, fed to um, black baldy heifers, Hereford Angus heifers. Uh, it was black muck. It was appalling looking stuff, but in fact, they did extremely well on it, but it had next to no energy and it was a really poor lactic uh, acid ferment fermentation. So they need a lot of management. Uh, the, the bottom left uh, that we're looking at is 50 days regrowth in that particular field but that was year one year two did really well year three um we ended up taking it out <clears throat> now multi-species proper multi-species legume and herb mixtures and this is downland's multi-species legume and herb mixture um, and of course what's the point in having one nowadays and not designing it to comply with the sam3 regulation um SAM3 regulations, uh, we walk on a tightrope, folks, because multi-species to some people might mean two grasses, two legumes and two herbs, because that's multi-species. However, if you are reading that wonderful 156 page um, guidance to the SFI, uh, their notes on this say it must be five different grass species, three different legumes and five different herbs. Now, looking for five herbs that are agriculturally worthwhile putting in is really a bit of a challenge. Um, if we look at this downland multi-species legume and herb mix, which I've got to be quite honest, I've designed it. Um, we've got ribwort plantain in at 4%. So in a 14 kilogram sow out, that's, uh, that's about 0.6 of a kilogram of plantain, which is quite a lot. 
There's two and a half percent chicory, which is probably just slightly under under um, half a kilo. Um, sheep's burnet, um, as as John will will say to many of you, you do find burnet in a, in a, a sward, and it is a useful grazing um, part. Sheep's parsley, rarely do we ever see it contributing very much, and yarrow. Yarrow does uh, do well, but yarrow is um, over 30 pounds a kilo, folks, and it doesn't survive against the higher input of, of the other ingredients as well as plantain chicory or indeed even burnet. As far as the legumes concerned, we've got red clover at a decent amount, 3%. That should not affect, there's not too much estrogen that for, for that to affect um, use cycling. Um, Normally, if you put breeding stock onto high red clover swords, they tend to become anestrous. This work is really somewhat discredited. Now, it was more than 40 years ago done in Australia rather than New Zealand, and it was on pure red clover swords. So smaller amounts of red clover were not seeing the problem. In fact, the um, innovative farmers are seeing higher lamb birth weights and higher milk production when there is a red clover inclusion, a higher inclusion than this, I may add, um, in swords specifically for sheep to graze. White clover, of course, the backbone of the legumes for, for, for most of our forage requirements. Alcyke clover, um, it's, it's almost like a cross between the two. Uh, the flowers are pink. It thrives at lower pH. So it'll do from maybe, um, uh, you know, five, eight upwards. Um, it lasts about five years, folks. Um, but it's a good, uh, it's a good clover for, um, for dry soils, but also for waterlogged soils. Where there's river basins that flood regularly, I put alcite clover in. Used to be the cheap clover. Um, it's now eight pound eighty, so it's it's as dear as the other ones. Then when we look at the the ryegrass, Timothy, and so on, um. The creeping red fescue, the meadow fescue, and the tall fescue, hands up, absolutely, that 6% fescue, folks, is there to make it a multi-species lay, but they don't contribute an awful lot to the production. Um, there, you're not allowed to have more than 70% ryegrass in a multi-species lay for SAM3, so guess what? That has 70% perennial ryegrass in it, 7% Timothy, because it's still a very useful contributor. So that is the down in multi-species legume and herb. Um, we had it in Ireland last year, and it was in its first year last year, um, and um, it yielded 15.4 tonnes, uh, measured by Chuggis, uh, who are the, the, the government rather than by uh, DLF. Um, so we're really, really happy with it. We had it on beef farms, we had it on sheep farms, and indeed we had it uh, in a lot of dairy farms. So um, Dr. Thomas Maloney is our um, technical manager for Ireland. Um, we have had him about five years now. And any of you are really interested in legume um, and herb mixtures, DLF Ireland have a whole series of YouTube videos that Thomas has done. Um, his doctorate from um, University College Dublin are, is, is in multi-species legume and herbs. So I think it'd be fair to say that within European situations, DLF seeds are quite far ahead of anyone else in their design and, and, and in getting the results out of them. Um, so 15.4 tonnes of dry matter a hectare in the first year. That won't happen in year two with the legume and herb and it most certainly won't in year three. Um, SFI in England, obviously, that would qualify as SAM3. Um, 382 pounds a hectare per year. Now that obviously after um, Stephen Barclay's announcement is likely to be increased. Um, I don't know if they've actually put a figure onto the new one. There is talk of 10% for the summer onwards, but I think um, in comparison to GS4, which of course um, SAM3 is really uh, replacing those of you who've done GS4s, um, a good scheme, but you had more limitations. SAM3, it is really up to you to do as you wish. Uh, and I think if I was farming um, uh, on... Uh, a grassland farm or a mixed farm, I would certainly be putting SAM3 mixtures in. I, I, I definitely would. Uh, the new mixture is on page 16 of the of the download brochure. So if we move on, um, I'm getting well through it, folks, so don't worry. Uh, legumes on improved grassland, which is the NUM2 option. Uh, this is designed to introduce legume and herbs into existing grass swords. And we have an overseeding mixture that will be sown at a much lower sowing rate. 
because we're expecting that people will say they've got grasses there aplenty and they only want to bring in some extra botanical diversity with some more herbs and some more 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 more, more legumes so what are the backbone the backbone really when i first designed this because once again it's a dlf um uk and ireland mixture and it was indeed designed by me i had a quarter plantain a quarter white clover and a quarter red clover because those were the things that really genuinely overseeded quite well on our trials they actually came and we had a beneficial growth from them all the rest really struggled to come in an overseed situation but you know let's be honest put our cards on the table and say this is not easy and we've had many more failures than we have successes these plants are not competitive against ryegrass uh, the species have not been bred to for quick establishment other than um, the, the clovers and the plantains have some history of of breeding behind them um, uh, but they're all small seeds so we need to keep the seeds close to the surface but in soil you have to maximize seed to soil contact but but near the surface so if we're overseeding a thick thatch um, and we're using a wire tine grass harrow like an opico or an einbock or a, um, a cookerlene or something a lot of the seed will not catch soil so you have to have very very aggressive tine action for them to catch soil and probably a roller to follow up what I would normally say is um, if it's a if it's a grass harrow you're using really aggressive really aggressive as if you're destroying the sward um, if you've got GPS I would put half the seed on one way and half the seed the other way if you don't have GPS I would put all the seed on in the first pass and then travel over it again and then use some sort of ballast roller and um, if you're drilling it with a Vredo or a, a an Aitchison or something, um, or a, a moor, I should say moor, of course, being a, I'm a friend of Sammy's, um, then yes, brilliant machines for putting seed into the ground. Fine if you're sticking in a tetraploid ryegrass and it's gone down two and a half, three centimetres, it'll still come. You put anything on that list down three centimetres and will not see it. So you've got to catch soil, but not put it too deep. Um, most people use contractors for these sort of things and they want you to see where they've been so they put the they put the discs or the cooters in right to the right in so they can scar the field and you see it all done this is far too deep and far too wasteful so anyway uh, it's a challenge keep it near the surface um, and keep it in soil are people going to sow this sort of mixture for num2 I genuinely think vast majority of people are going to try and overseed existing grasses and claim it as a SAM 3, because instead of being 102 pounds, we're 380. Um, seed like that at farmer price is 12 pound 80, folks. It's not for nothing, um, uh, but you're not gonna get a lot. If you do that at one kilogram an acre, we're going to see very little benefit from doing them. Um, I would like to see people at about three kilograms an acre, but suddenly that becomes, um, you know, 38 pounds or whatever it is, um, uh, and I'm not so sure. And then the machine, you know, is going to be, um, um, if, it, if it's a if it's a wire tine harrow, it's probably 12 or 14 pounds an acre. If it's a if it's a, a guttler or something like that, it's going to be 25, 26 pounds an acre. So starts to add up. Right. Um, Honey, just I, coming, just coming back. So just really quickly on that, is there a a time when ideally you'd be putting those in the ground would it be sort of if you're on a grass if you're on a sheep farm you would probably come off really tight grazing in the spring and as soon as you boned it right down to nothing then get it in and um keep it grazed for as long as you can afterwards several 10 days afterwards and then take them Perfect, off john yeah you're absolutely right john so um they're all they all do better in the spring and um, some people would actually say please don't show a red clover even um uh, late in the autumn now you're in a kinder part of the world than we are so springtime all these species do better so bone it down hard as you can concrete yeah have it off put the seed in and keep stock on it so it'll have to be a pretty non um you, you know you can't be a, a really productive if you're if you're gimmering you lambs or something like that classic yeah or um some some class of stock that doesn't have to be too productive don't i mean if you are having to produce milk for twin lambs you, you're going to have to have this two bear so you probably keep them in for about seven to ten days john and um, and all we're doing is keeping the existing sward really really short so when these plants get up 
they can catch some light. Yeah. Now, really, we want a plantain to try and get it up to about eight inches tall before we give it its first graze. Yeah. So that's quite a, quite a delay. You would graze an overseed with grass and clover faster than you would with these sort of things in it. So you may well be off it for something like four weeks, maybe even five weeks um, in the springtime. So you have to see whether or not you've got the, 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 the grass elsewhere to be able to do that. Are people going to do this? Uh, John, this is going to fly out the door, um, I'm afraid, um, and they're going to try and claim Sam 3 on it. And, you know, I don't think anybody within DEFRA has really thought through that this isn't going to achieve the aims of Sam 3. That's what they're going to do, though. So spring sown, sow it, keep stock on it for seven to ten days after. Um, then when it does get up, um, probably better to have, if we're talking sheep here, I'll talk sheep, um, 10 to 15 ewes on an acre for three or four days and move them off it. Don't put on six ewes an acre and leave them for the next fortnight. So much better to, to mob them on, um, knock it back, uh, and indeed that'll help control some of the weeds that will come um any 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 form of soil um uh, disturbance will, will bring some weeds and of course there's nothing you can do chemically to control them in this you can of course use a topper so if you go through it and graze them then um and there's there's um you know um, something left go through it with a pulverizer topper it's the best weed control i'm sorry to say that to a chemical man it's the best weed control in in all these um, um complex mixtures Right, two slides quickly on, on, on hybrid brassicas, folks. Um, they are really, really fast growing. Um, and we've got a new one out that has come from New Zealand to us uh, called Mainstar. We're absolutely delighted. It's the highest yielding one we have ever had. Um, it branches from the bottom. And if you snap the stems, you don't see, they don't hold on to each other. There's no fiber across. If you take interval or something and snap it, you'll see the, the, the fibers going across. It'll not break cleanly. Um, so this branches from the bottom. Um, that's it. Uh, the, the picture on the left is it in uh, Cornhill, but Cornhill at, at, at Bucky. So that's up on the, on the North Aberdeenshire coast, really hard climate. Um, grazed by sheep, uh, they ha they've left between five and eight inches of stem and then you get bounced back it regrows so people have been growing it for for a graze um uh you know late summer and then taking sheep off it and then you can graze with cattle or sheep afterwards um through the winter time <clears throat> it's a great new product if you're looking at um one of these hybrid brassicas um they're yielding about six six and a half tons of dry matter a hectare um stubble turnips maybe five four and a half five a kale's maybe nine or ten but Kale is expensive to buy. It is hard to keep it alive for flea beetle, and it's a full season crop. You have to have it in quite a lot earlier than this. <clears throat> we will sell it out, I'm afraid. Uh, we're not going to have enough of it. We, we are short of our requirement by 20 tonnes of this one. It's trialed so well. Um, I very foolishly put it onto six farms for trial. Uh, two of them were SAC beef and sheep advisors. Both of them have been singing its praises ever since, and we've got a, a problem. Anyway, when we do sell out, remember, we've got Spitfire. Um, it's a sister variety to Mainstar. They're all bred by PGG Wrightsons in New Zealand, who bred Swift, Red Start, Pulsar, uh, Winfred. Um, so they're all bred by the same company who we own. Um, a Rape Kale Cross, slower to mature than Mainstar. Um, uh, it needs probably 12 to 14 day, uh, weeks to get it up there. Monty White, our new technical man who's in that photograph, folks. Uh, Monty paid second row uh, for Lincoln University uh, with um, uh, one of the Barrett boys, the, the second row boy. He is 6'6". Six, six. He's a huge guy, so that is a big crop. Um, very digestible stems and multi grays. Um, that actually on the right hand side is one of the SAC advisors who has her own farm, and um, that was her in a trial of it, not not this year, last year, in fact. So DLF have a whole series of partner farms across the world. Uh, we've got six in Ireland, which we started a bit earlier, 11 in the UK, and we're trialing grass, legumes, herbs, and brassicas to see what works, what all our breeding efforts actually work for farmers in the United Kingdom. 
And what we have trialing is plantain and clover mixtures with and without grasses. Most excitingly, probably we're trialing grazing red clovers and different plantains. Grazing red clovers, we have two, relish and amigain. Neither of them, unfortunately, are available for sale in the UK yet. Um, they are widely used in New Zealand and Australia and in South America, but we haven't got them passed here yet for the UK. Um, we're hoping to get them. Um, that's me in a field uh, on the right hand side. I'm the exceptionally ugly looking little man on the right hand side there. Um, that's in a field of ecotain, which is a plantain that um, dilutes urine. So we get much less urine patches um, and we get uh, much less wasted nitrogen. Uh, it's a, a a new plantain that's got a lot of a future, and the water boards, Thames Water, Trent Water, and so on, are very very interested in it. As unfortunately are some of the milk buyers. <clears throat> anyway, these partner farms are uh, where we're doing a lot of developmental work, and they're they're, they're extremely useful to have. And um, the young chap in the third photograph from the right, um, he has put a new dairy farm on every single year since 2019 um, uh, as a guide last year 2023 they bought 10.6 tons of grass seed um, that's in Dumfries and he's knocking out 18 tons of dry matter he is on the coast that's the sea you can see behind him um, but we work uh, to get proper results that will work for farmers yeah it's not just our breeders saying here's something new we are taking it out sowing it with real farmers and seeing how it works there's the new brochure um john will have these in probably about three weeks time maybe even two weeks time we also have another brochure that covers all the environmental mixtures it's called the your countryside and um, all our grasses are bred in line with our, our in in the uk are, are with um being uh, recommended by um, niab or by sruc and many of them by both um, and Thank you for your attention and um, have you any questions? Thank you very much, Paddy. Appreciate that. That was uh, really useful. It was a, a good tour through where our grass uh, needs may need improving and sort of the options we have available to us to uh, improve our productivity. Just a reminder to everyone, if you want to ask any questions at the top of the screen, you have the Q&A section. If you have an iPad right down the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A or you can text or WhatsApp me uh, any questions. I'm just going to check if I've got any more come up. I had none since the last ones. Um, no, I've had none so far. Um, have, I, have I closed my screen, John? You have closed your screen. It's just a big ugly picture of me now. So I'm going to um, I'm going to share a different screen again because I don't want my picture up there because it's not a good looking one. There we go. We'll put that the the original screen back there. Um, does anyone anyone have any questions? Come on, you're bound to have one between you. It's <laughs> bound to be one. So um, I'm going to pick on someone. I'm going to pick on Carwin. I'm going to pick on Donna, and I'm going to pick on Mark. Uh, Mark Jones, any of you, you need to come up with a question. You guys are, are on it on your grassland. Oh, look at that. No questions. Don't worry. Um, I'm actually quite a nice lad. Um, uh, so I do apologize for frightening people. But, John, um, when we do these things and we regularly do these things, it's very impersonal in comparison to being standing next to somebody in a field or indeed even in a hotel room. Uh, so, you know, very often I'll do a talk. There won't be a question during the talk and we stop for a cup of coffee at the end. And you can't get to us for people asking questions. No, I can imagine that. I can imagine. Um, do you, Paddy, have any um, sort of picture indicators of what swords should be looking like? Sort of if you took a visual overhead image of density of a sward. Obviously, this time of year, like we talked about recently, it's going to be as thin as anything. There's not you're not going to do a good sward assessment because clover is going to recover, etc. But do you, well, is there any way people can get a visual assessment guide? No, there's. The, I mean, if you're looking at sort of winter barley or winter wheat, where you do the old leaf area index, which is I think is now green area index. Um, we, we, January is it just it's pointless. But what did I do today? I assessed a lucerne, a red clover, and three ryegrasses. Um, 
totally different, John, depending on on whether it's been grazed hard by sheep or not. Uh, this is all grasses that were sown in the second half of 2023. If it's sown in the spring of 23 or before, vast majority of them are thick enough, really are. But just remember our two big friends in the bag that can help us. If it's thin, yeah, nitrogenous fertilizer early will make it cast more tillers. Yeah, nitrogen is a great yield builder. And two, um, because of course the legumes, they, they don't fix nitrogen until we're about 12 or 14 degrees. So if you're putting perennial, uh, if you're putting ammonium nitrate or urea on at, at sort of, you know, consistent soil temperatures of five and a half, six, you are going to encourage um, uh, tillering. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking of, you know, probably in your part of the world from, if it's a thin crop from 20th of February onwards, and don't forget phosphate um, because the roots are much smaller than normal. If it's an older grass, John, you know, just all I would say is check there's enough plants by putting heel to heel that square mm -hmm. foot. And as long as there's 30 plants in that, um, I, ha I hold out hope. You know, when we first had oilseed rape in the 1970s, we used to say plough oilseed rape out if there wasn't at least 30 plants in the square metre. We now target eight. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you'll think yeah. people can manage plants better now. Um, uh, now, grasses have to be sown to a stand. They can't they can't creep other than red fescue and, and weed grasses like bent and cooch. Um, but what they can, of course, do is bud off daughter tillers. So if you feed it, it'll want to do that. If you then knock out the apical dominance by a, a mouth. Yeah. So let it grow, knock it down, let it grow. It'll keep budding out. And that's how you thicken the sward if it's, if it's thin. Fertilizer management. And of course, all those things I said about physical improvement. You know, if, if, if the drains are blocked and you haven't cleared them, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> how, how do you manage a pond at 700 feet that only appeared this summer? It's great. Back actor, get out with the digger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Find well, out. I, haven't, I haven't seen any more questions come through. So... I'd like to say thank you to Paddy for the last 45, well, the last hour, actually. Really appreciate you talk through it, Paddy. It's very useful and very interesting. If you have any questions or you want to come and uh, talk to us or just give us a call or pop into a farm centre, uh, we we're going to put this online as well so you can see it on YouTube again if you if you really like to see Paddy on my face again. Um, so we can do, we're doing that. We're having a follow-up in-field discussion some point in March. I have, I've got it down as March the 4th, but it might be slightly later than that. I'm going to double check. Uh, so we will have a, a better chance to go and assess grassland in fields and look at what we can do to improve it more practical based. Um, again, we'll broadcast and highlight that before we do it, both on the WhatsApp group we just started and uh, through the newsletter, etc. And by all means, feel free to come to it. If you have any more ideas of talks that you'd like to see us run or do, please let us know and we will try and run them. We'll try and find someone who's like Paddy, knows knows cuts the mustard, knows their stuff, and we can uh, we can sort something out. So in the meantime, thank you very much, Paddy. I really appreciate that. And I think we can all start leaving. So if you can all start clicking out to leave, that'd be grand. Thank you very much, RM Jones and John. Super.